today we're going to be looking at conceptual distinction in orthodox christian theology and this presentation is going to be based on dr david bradshaw's academic uh four-page academic paper on saint gregory palamas and distinction cut epinoia if you've been following some of my content for a couple of for a couple of months you most likely have heard me talk about this but Today, I want to dedicate a video specifically to conceptual distinction and how it's used in Orthodox Christian theology because it is, I think, quite important. Uh, the Trinitarian distinctions, the distinction of Christ's two natures, the distinction even between essence and energy, all of these things uh, and conceptual distinction are related. But a lot of people get confused and, and acquire wrong ideas about what we mean when we say conceptual distinction and today in this video i'm going to be also uh, tackling those errors so what is epinoia right conceptual epinoia what is what is con concept or conceptions anyway dr david bradshaw says that broadly speaking epinoia includes the faculty the act and the resulting conception formed by the process of reflecting on the deliverances of sense perception so it can mean imaginations, right? So for example, a unicorn is an epinoia we form in our mind based off of a horse by adding a horn on top of his head. Uh, voila, you got a unicorn and also other you know, magic fairy stuff that doesn't exist in rea reality. That is an imagination, but not all epinoia have to be imagination. For example, an illusory distinction or an illusion or an imagination made up by the mind uh, can be between one or two things that do not exist in reality, but only in the mind. Whereas a conceptual distinction, on the other hand, can be that, but it can also be more than that. It can also mean a distinction in the mind that maps onto reality. Dr. David Bradshaw uh, further on says, from the contrast of the distinction katepinoian and that which is real, it is a short step to distinguishing two kinds of existence, the merely conceptual and the actual. However, the two contrasts do not map neatly onto one another, for items that are distinguished katepinoian, conceptually speaking that is, can both exist in actuality, but that their division is the one that is only conceptual, meaning that it doesn't exist in reality. And so this is how we can have distinctions in reality that do not imply division. It is that the division is something that only exists in our, in our, in our mind. Uh, David, Dr. Bradshaw quotes St. John Damascus uh, in his Dialectica. He says, the example of soul and body uh, figures importantly in the dialectic of John Damascene, where it is enlisted to clarify the difference between a veridical and a merely imaginative use of epinoia. John identifies the later with bare epinoia. And epinoia, in the fuller sense, is a certain thinking out and consideration by which the general concept and unanalyzed knowledge of things are unfolded and made fully clear. Man, for example, appears to be simple, but because, you know, we look at a human being and we see, oh, he's one thing, right? But we, upon further inspection, we realize, wait a second, man has a body and a soul. So he's, he's a c composite of two things. He has a body and a soul. And this is something that you can reach with only with conceptualization. Uh, further on, our conceptual distinctions, can they be real distinctions? Absolutely. Uh, what is conceptual, what is divided in something can be only, as I said, so for, for example, when you distinguish the persons in the Trinity, uh, the, the division that seems to be in the mind is something that only exists in the mind. So the, the feature of their division is only in the mind. But in reality, the persons in the Trinity are absolutely not divided. But they are in reality still distinct. So the mind can reach to that conclusion uh, in reality. What is referred to as a real distinction in Orthodox literature is, is a conceptual distinction, oftentimes, is a conceptual distinction of a thing that is seemingly simple but conceptually multiple or plural. This multiplicity producing division is something that happens in the mind only, not in reality. Yet the plurality that the mind realizes can indeed 
be something real. And we're going to be looking at patristic quotations, so for example, from St. Basil the Great, where this is happening. Uh, quoting once again from Dr. David Bradshaw, he says, What all this shows is that to speak of two things as distinct katepinoian, meaning distinct conceptually, is taken alone, not an ontological statement at all. If it was ontological statement, then that will mean the things that are being distinguished only exist in the mind as well and do not exist in reality. But it is not so. It is an epistemological statement in that it identifies the means by which we conceive or recognize the two things as distinct, that is true reflection rather than sense experience as we saw earlier. That, as we saw earlier, this had been the basic meaning of the term ever since antiquity. Confusion enters because the term epinoia is also used in statements that do have ontological significance, as when something is said to be conceived by bare epinoia, meaning in the imagination or to exist in epinoia and not in reality, which is why we shall carefully look at some of the patristic statements and understand contextually what it means. And so this is something, again, I've talked about many times before. Again, in the example of Christ's two natures, this distinction is conceptual because we do not divide Christ into two subjects. Right? So this is one of those examples that we can use. So now let's get to the patristic quotations on Epinoia and how especially the Cappadocian fathers and the ecumenical councils understand this conceptual distinction. For Eunomius, we, cannot, we need to understand what Eunomius was kind of saying before we understand what St. Basil is replying to him with. Because for Eunomius, we cannot conceptually speak of God because the moment we do that, we will introduce plurality and multiplicity in God. And to do that will be polytheism for Eunomius. So we don't do this. Um, and so the only ways we can come to know God is either through sense perception, but that's impossible because God is invisible. Therefore, we speak of God by knowing him in his essence. So for Eunomius, the way we achieve knowledge of God is by knowing God's essence. And that's how we have knowledge of God uh, at all. Whereas St. Basil says, no, we don't know God in his essence, but we can know him from the conceptions. And he denies the idea that conceptions imply division. St. Basil in Against Eunomius says, whatever seems simple and singular upon a general survey by the mind, but which appears complex and plural upon detailed scrutiny and thereby is divided by the mind, this sort of thing is said to be divided in thought alone. So when we speak of God's plural energies, the division of those energies is only conceptual. But in reality, those divine energies, although they protect our distinction, so they are plural in that way, they are not divided in reality. So they're not separate from each other. <clears throat> And St. Basil says, What reason could there be then for denying that each of these names is conceptualized and that they constitute a confession of what truly belongs to God? So these names and conceptions of God bear metaphysically onto real things relating to God. So they're not merely conceptual, but they speak really about God. We can really speak about God and come to know Him through these conceptions. Uh, Leontius of Jerusalem in his Against the Monophysite, this is from his Aporia, where he asks multiple questions to the Monophysite positions. This is the tenth question that he asks. And this is in response to because Monophysites will quote St. Cyril, who will say that, we, that Christ is only two natures according to the mind. And they will say, well, well you see, Leontius, you see, Chalcedonius, we accept two natures only conceptually, but he is not in reality in two natures. And so Leontius gets to this problem by saying, well, wait a second. How else would you distinguish invisible things if not conceptually speaking, right? You can't distinguish between something visible and invisible or two things that are invisible by sense perception because they're invisible. You can't even see them. So how can you even conceive of invisible things, right? So logic, for example, will be something invisible. How do we conceive of logic? Conceptually, right? And so how do we conceive of the human nature of Christ, which can be observed with sense perception, and the divine nature, which cannot be observed by sense perception, but only something we can conceive invisibly, only conceptually? And so when we speak of conceptual distinction of the two natures in Christ, 
what we're actually saying that there really are the two natures and we know these these two natures conceptually and we can divide uh, we can distinguish them so and that their distinction is real although their division is something that only exists in the mind and i'm repeating myself constantly so that you can understand what i'm trying to say here you can also pause this video and just read what leontius says you'll understand that he says exactly the same thing i'm saying just in a in a more nuanced way and this gets to the other feature of conceptual distinction, which is Trinitarian distinctions, meaning the distinctions of the divine persons. This is from St. Gregory Theologian, Oration 29. He says, In the very same way there is one essence of God, and one nature and one name, although in accordance with a distinction in our thoughts, we use distinct names, and that whatever is properly called by this name really is God. Whatever is properly called. He is talking about the divine persons, whatever is probably called by this name, really is God. And so we can, we again, conceptually distinguish the persons in the Trinity. Once again, in this time in Oration 23, St. Gregory the Theologian does this. Each one God, each person is God, if contemplated separately, because the mind can divide the indivisible, the three God, if contemplated collectively, because their activity and nature are the same. So again, St. Gregory is distinguishing the persons in, you know, conceptually speaking. So if all conceptual distinctions meant an illusory distinction, then that will mean that Trinitarian distinctions, the con distinctions between the divine persons in the Trinity will then likewise be illusory, which will be heresy. But what we say is the persons in the Trinity are distinct, but they're not divided from each other which is exactly what St. Gregory Theologian is saying here. St. Kirill of Alexandria does the same in his, in his commentary on the book of John. Uh, in his first book, chapter 3, he's talking about John 14, 11, which Christ says, I am in the Father and the Father in me. And when St. Kirill is talking about that, he's talking about cause, in a sense, cause and effect, conceptually speaking. He says, I suppose the visible in idea, but one in nature, and the one proceeding by a sort of indivisible and continuous fortcome from the other, so as to seem to be even severed from, actually, I think the more, I should just read the entire thing. Sorry, I'll just go back to reading the entire thing. He says, I am in the Father and the Father in me, as if the sweetness of the honey when laid on the tongue should say of itself, I am in the honey and the honey in me. Or as though again the heat that proceeds naturally from fire emitting a voice were to say, I am in the fire and the fire in me. For each of the things mentioned is, I suppose, Divisible in idea, but one in nature, and the one proceeding by a sort of indivisible and continuous fortcome from the other, so as to seem to be even severed from that wherein it is, yet though the force of ideas regarding these things take, takes this form, still one appears in the other, and both are the same as regards essence. So we can conceptually divide them, but we understand that, for example, again, uh, the, the sweetness of the honey and the honey itself are only conceptually divided, but not so in reality, but they're still distinct, right? Again, the heat that proceeds from the fire, the heat is in the fire and the, and the fire is in the heat. And you can divide these things conceptually. You can come to know these things conceptually, right? This is why it's epistemological. That the only way you can come to know this is conceptually speaking separately. Once again, we're going to be quoting St. Gregory Theologian in Oration 30. Uh, he In this oration, he is distinguishing the two natures of Christ conceptually. He says, and, and an indication of this is found in the fact that wherever the natures are distinguished in our thoughts from one another, the names are also distinguished. As you hear in Paul's words, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. The God of Christ, but the Father of glory. For although these two terms express one person, yet this is not by unity of nature, but by a union of the two, what could be clearer? Right, So these two terms that will seemingly imply two distinct persons actually refer to the same person, but rather they refer to the natures that that person is from. And in, in especially the, the non-Chalcedonian debates, a lot of people get into the topic of, you know, the two natures in Christ, you know, how do we understand this, St. Kirill of Alexandria. And once you read... Uh, 
Patrick Gray's defense of Calcedon in the East and um, and Father John McGuckin's book, St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy, especially the the part of that book where, where he speaks about the ecumenical reception of St. Cyril's theology in Chalcedon, Father John McGuckin makes this point. And by the way, if you read God History and Dialectic, what does Joseph Farrell do? He also makes this very same point. So it's an orthodox view of, of the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, and I made this point, this is like the 10th time I think I'm making the same point, is uh, when we're speaking of conceptual distinctions, um, Chalcedon is doing exactly the same as well. So, uh, this is strictly in contradiction to the Nestorian view, how Chalcedon distinguishes the two natures in Christ, which is in Epinoia. Uh, because the in, the in the Nestorian view, it will necessitate and imply and lead to the to the na notion that Christ's two natures have to be distinct, being distinguished concretely, meaning that there are two concrete different things that are being distinguished here. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention is that the distinction between hypostasis and nature, yes, that also is conceptual. But as we've seen throughout this video, things that are distinguished conceptually is really distinguished a lot of times. And in fact, Leontius' whole, whole project, the answer to Jerusalem and the Kirillic-Kalkadonis' whole project is to understand and to show, if conf to, to illustrate that confusing hypostasis as just nothing more than particular nature leads you to a myriad of different heresies. So for example, if you say that hypostasis, all that hypostasis is, is just a particular nature uh, with with particularizing characteristics. Well, in terms in terms of the Trinity, what would you get? You will have three natures in the Trinity, meaning three gods. In reality, too, that's tritheism. That is basically polytheism, in fact. And another irony here, and Leontius points this out. Another irony is that th those particular characteristics, they won't really be particular at all because they will be part of the nature as well. So those particular accidents will actually be essential characteristics. And that will naturally imply that all human beings, actually all human beings are different human natures as well. You see? So this kind of a view where you reduce hypostasis into nature leads you to different heresies. But what do we do? We conceptually distinguish hypostasis from nature, meaning that they're really distinct, but they're not something that you can separate. Right? They're not divisible in reality. And again, before we get to the Chalcedonian Creed, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, again, understands that Christ's two natures are distinguished conceptually. Um, the, the Council says, when the natures are conceptually separated, the names are also divided, says Gregory the Theologian, and all or holy fathers, avoiding the confusion of the natures, say that the natures are distinct conceptually by reason of difference, not of division from each other. Nestorius divides the natures in reality, but the Catholic Church confesses the union without confusion and only conceptually divides the natures indivisibly, confessing Emmanuel to be one and the same also after the union. So this, was, this argument was used in refutation to the iconoclasts who claimed that we were distinguishing Christ's natures not conceptually but in reality. Uh, in, in in a concrete sense, meaning that we we will somehow be Nestorians, right? So this was an iconoclast argument, and so the the iconophile, you know, the the Seventh Ecumenical Council kind of elaborates on the Christological view and refutes this understanding. And finally, uh, you've probably seen this image multiple times. Maybe uh, I I that on the left side you see the Chalcedonian Creed, the the Confession of the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, where it speaks about Christ, the red underlines are from uh, are quotes from Saint Cyril of Alexandria. The blue is a quote you can specifically find from Saint Leo. And the important part, which we're going to be getting at here, is about the two natures: um, that Christ is consubstantial with the Father in Godhead and is consubstantial with us in manhood, like us in all things but sin begotten from the Father before the ages as regards his Godhead, and in these last days the same one begotten from the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, as regards his manhood. For our sake and for the sake of our salvation, 
one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, who is made known in two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Now, uh, the difference of natures being by no means removed because of the union, but the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one prosopon and one hypostasis, not parted or divided into two prosopa. So this is explicitly ref refuting the Nestorian understandings. But what we want to focus on is that in, in, in saying who is made known, this is, this is especially from the book, uh, Father John McCuckin's book on St. Kirill of Alexandria. There's a number there. It says 26. That's a footnote. And if you read the book, you will know what that footnote means. And it's referring to, it's referring to a Greek term, gnorizumeno. And again, uh, Dr. Farrell and uh, Patrick Gray, both of these people affirm that gnorizumeno is used in the Chalcedonian Creed. And what is really interesting about this term is that on the other image in the same PowerPoint slide, we will see that uh, Father McCuckin explains St. Kirill's Christological position and what he's what he's trying to say. And and even in his Mia Physis Christology, he says, but this is nothing else, but this, nothing else, is what the Chalcedonian text teaches. Um, this can be seen nowhere more clearly than in the verbal form which derives that whole central clause containing the four adverbs qualifying into natures. It is none other than Gnorizumenon made known to the intellect. Chalcedon therefore teaches that Christ is made known to the intellect in two natures. It does not simply teach that Christ is in two natures as the Antiochian system has suggested. Those who do not recognize or understand the importance of the difference are those who have not followed the whole 5th century Christological debate. So if you don't understand this very basic thing, and this is for the Roman Catholics, this is for the Orientals, this is even for fellow Orthodox who try to be uh, theology pros, if you don't understand this, you don't even understand basic 5th century Christological debates. And so what we understand is that the conceptual distinction in many of our church fathers, in many of our councils, such as the 7th council or the 4th council, use this conceptual distinction. And so when we conceptually distinguish then God's essence and his energies, again, we're just saying that this form of distinction is the same form of distinction uh, such as the distinction between the two natures in Christ, such as the distinction between the persons in the Trinity, such as the per, uh, distinction between the many different names and conceptions and energies of God. All of these are conceptual. And all of these are real distinctions. Distinctions that are indeed in reality. And so I hope you understand from this presentation what conceptual distinction means. And in, in and how important in Orthodox theology it actually is, and I wanted to kind of end this video uh, by by giving you that little summary and how it's how it's used, how important it is, and how we should understand conceptual distinction. Again, the conceptual distinction is an epistemological understanding uh, of observing some certain things sometimes that seem to be uh, one but are in reality both one and plural, and its plurality is conceived in the mind. And so when we consider these plural things in the mind, no matter what you want to do, they are always going to be divided because you are uh, considering each of these things in and of themselves. right? So they are divided in the mind. But this division is something that is only in the mind, not in reality. What is in reality and conceptual is that the, is the is the distinction between these th these things, and these things that are you, you're looking at conceptually also do exist in reality. So again, with the let's look at the example of body and soul. Uh, we can only understand the soul conceptually speaking. So we have to conceptually distinguish body and soul. We can't distinguish them in any other form. But this distinction, obviously, body is not the soul, and the soul is not the body. So they are really distinct. But when we consider soul in and of itself, that division does not exist in reality. That division only exists in how we view the soul. And so once you see things in that manner, in that form, I think a lot of this, a lot of Christology and triadology and a lot of theology is going to be much more simpler for you to understand. 
and i would like to end this video here if you like this video be sure to share this around subscribe to my channel if you haven't liked this video and if you want to you can support my channel by patreon donations or btc donations and whatnot and uh again thank you for watching this i'll see you guys in the next video god be with you all thank you for watching